Hello, everyone. I'm Kamran. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. Today, we will be discussing Book 1, Chapter 5 of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 2 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Just know that Kamran and I know that this series is the best fantasy story ever written, and we're approaching this from a purely fanboy point of view. Not any critique here, just love for Mr. Erickson. We'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that haven't read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. A quick warning, today's episode may contain frustrating scenes from certain parties and individuals directed at other individuals, so we'll just <laughs> move along with that, shall we? <laughs> our show is listener-supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon Weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you, and we really mean that, so send any feedback or comments that you've got to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. This week, we have a couple of additions. First, Yvonne reached out to us again. Billy, I believe you're still interested in expanding the Enforcer franchise into Europe, aren't you? Oh, yes. I'm always looking for enthusiastic folks that are hardworking, slightly sociopathic, <laughs> or even mildly psycho <laughs> psychopathic that are eager to expand the Enforcer franchise. So for a low, low introductory fee of like maybe 500 grand, you two can start your own exciting lifestyle. Call me today. Mm -hmm. um, start up your own Enforcer franchise in a city state near you. So subject not <laughs> may not be available in all states or countries. So. Introductory place may vary due to restrictions, so call today. I thought the Kerrville Enforcer was a force for good. Now you're saying you're looking for sociopathic <laughs> and psychopathic individuals? Well, hey, look at Batman. It requires some of the highest functioning individuals of a society. Lawyers, surgeons, have a touch of this. It kind of hones them. <laughs> okay, so you so want a touch of that. I'm not talking dangerous. Slightly. Yeah, okay. Mildly. Mild. Slightly psychopath sociopathic or mildly. On a scale of 1 to 10. How much? Like a one. Sociopath. Like a one. <laughs> okay. On a bad, on a on a one day, on a one on a bad day, maybe a two. I think it tends more to the obsessive traits of those guys okay. that are very uh, attention to detail oriented, shall we say? Right. And would I be going out on a limb saying that they care about the rules? That's the whole point of the enforcer organization, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's a uh, rules. Um, <clears throat> rules are you know this is not nom. We need rules. So. <laughs> okay. All right, joking aside, Yvonne was listening to the episode where we discussed how Perrin took the news about his mother and father dying and him being stoic about it and mentioning that he thought that all of this and also, he added, everything that's happened where you had the uprising and the culling of the nobility, he was taking that on himself. So Yvonne reminded us of a deal made between Hood and Opan in Gardens of the Moon as Perrin lay dying before the gate to Hood's realm. I'm going to read the excerpt here from Gardens of the Moon, and then we'll discuss after. Okay. Hood's apparition cackled, then stopped abruptly. It said, how unfortunate. A mellifluous, deep-throated laugh would be more to my liking. Ah, well, in answer, nor does my lord appreciate your interruption of this natural passage of a soul. Sister Opon said, murder at the hand of a god. That makes him fair game. The apparition grunted, shuffled close to look down at Perrin. It said, What, Opon, do you wish of my lord? Brother Opon said, Nothing from me. Sister? Sister Opon said, Even for the gods, death awaits, an uncertainty hiding deep within them. She paused and said, Make them uncertain. The apparition cackled again and said, Reciprocity. And here's the important part. I just wanted a little context okay. there. Right. Sister Opon said, Of course I'll look for another. A death premature, meaningless even. The apparition was silent. Then the head creaked in a nod. It said, in this mortal shadow, of course. Sister Opon said, agreed. Perrin asked, my shadow? What does that mean precisely? The apparition said, much sorrow, alas. Someone close to you shall walk through death's gates in your place. Perrin said, no, take me instead. I beg of you. The apparition snapped, be quiet. Pathos makes me ill. <laughs> That must be tough serving Hood and having this reaction to the things that you do, seeing what happens to the people that are going into Hood's realm. Yeah, and it would make this guy, imagine how many billions of times this guy's heard this. <laughs> yeah, talk about needing some sociopathic characteristics. Yes. That's the job for that. Yes. Going back to Yvonne's message, he said that he always thought that Perrin's response to Dujek when Dujek told him the bad news was due to Perrin going through a nihilistic phase. 
but now he thinks the passage I just read means that the mother or father, or maybe both, were taken instead as part of this deal. Hmm. And I agree with that assessment, and I really appreciate you bringing this to us, Yvonne. Yes, I do too. And uh, <clears throat> these guys were just nihilists, Donnie, so <laughs> I'm sorry. Anytime we have nihilist conversations, I have to... <laughs> You know what's bad is I just now got the double entendre of that line. These men are nihilist, Donnie. There's nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> okay. Is that a double joke? Possibly. It would not surprise me in the least. I thought it was just like, there's nothing to be afraid of. We're a lot tougher than these guys. We're going to wipe the floor with. No, it was like, there's n nothing to be afraid of because they're not. I, yeah, I'm slow, dude. What do you want? <laughs> hey, man, I took it the same way you did. But you agree with that assessment? You think they're tied together? Yeah, I do. Okay. I do agree they're tied together. And, and, th and thank you, because if I'm not mistaken, I asked you the question. I said, did you think that would be Felicin at that time in Gardens of the Moon? That's what we thought. Mm -hmm. I never connected these two. And so this makes a lot better sense. And so, yeah, this, this is brilliant. So thank you, Yvonne. We really, really appreciate that. Well done. Second edition, we received a message from Dane. It's been a while. Dane. He appreciated the conversation we had regarding Rake fighting the Segula and being amazed that he only made it to the seventh spot. Dane thinks that if Rake was having straight up one-on-one -on -one duels, assuming some normal interval for rest, things would have been much different instead of being under constant attack for two hours. He might have made it to a higher rank. Yeah, I agree. Also, to Billy's point about where various characters would fall on the ranking scale, Dane would love to see that somewhere, like a tier list, a full compendium of character power on the Segula scale. And he would like us to go down that rabbit hole. Nice. I think that's an interesting idea. Yeah. And maybe we could record a special episode, which would be full spoilers. So all the characters from oh, yeah. the books where we debate and come up with a tier list of all the characters that we know of. And obviously this right. would leave some room for interpretation and we need to keep bias under control <clears throat> tobokai <clears throat> sure sure <laughs> <laughs> probably a couple more i could name there yeah um, yeah 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 but thanks dane for the message yes thank you dane and also a special thanks to all of our patreon members we truly appreciate your support and any messages you send us keep them coming that's right keep them coming folks thanks so much all right chapter five part two we pick up the chapter during a conversation between the Mibe and Caladan Brood. Brood asked, what if Kalor's right? The Mibe's eyes narrowed and she said, then, Warlord, you had best give him leave to cut me down the same time he kills my daughter. Brood's wide, flat brow furrowed as he scowled down at her. He said, I remember you, you know, among the tribes when we campaigned in the north, young, fiery, beautiful, seeing you, seeing what the child has done to you, causes pain within me, woman. The Mibe said, mine is greater, I assure you, warlord, yet I choose to accept it. And that is quite true. No one is feeling this more than her. Yes. Aging is rough. I'm starting to see the effects of it as I progress through my 40s, and I don't love it. <laughs> Imagine it being accelerated to this degree, especially for someone that had barely entered adulthood. Uh, let me ask you this. I know that you're like into uh, jujitsu or taekwondo right now. Jujitsu. Jujitsu. So have you always been a very competitive individual? Like you like to fight or like to do very sportsman, like very just, you know, aggressive kind of person? Personality wise, I know this to be, but physically. <laughs> I swam in high school, but I was okay. never the well, most right. driven individual. I didn't like losing, but when I think about some of the people that I knew that were trained really hard in high school, I never had that fire. Oh, okay. I asked this because our friend Mike that we worked with in LP, he's going to feel aging is rough because he's a little bit younger than you. And he has had like broken his shoulder blades. He's so hyper competitive, had both knees already replaced. It's about been his, uh, didn't break it, but um, been, it been his arm back so bad falling off while rock climbing. And it's like, He's going to be hating his 40s. He's already hating life now. I was always very lazy. <laughs> mm. I, I'm a video game. Uh, that's my exercise. And uh, so I don't have a, too much of the aches and pains. I have the tall back problems because tall people just have back problems being my age. I'm 55. So. <laughs> you know what I was thinking about today? We had some people over today, so there's a lot of dishes involved when we cook. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing there. I was thinking if I had my way, my sink would be a lot deeper and my counter mm -hmm. would be a lot higher. Absolutely. Absolutely. And 
<laughs> it is really uncomfortable to lean over oh, that sink dolly. washing dishes for a long period of time. Yeah. And then my thoughts went to, okay, would you be able to sell that house? And would that be a selling point? Maybe somebody else that was a little bit taller. My dad, than average. My yeah. dad would have bought that house on that premise alone. <laughs> my father's six, seven. So the first time we ever snow skied, because snow skiing was really expensive, you know, he bought the first pair of rental skis and boots because he wore a 15 and no one had that boot and he liked skiing enough. He says, you know what? We'll do this again, probably at least one more time. At least it's, you know, it's pay for it. So he just bought it right out because it was like they were that way. And his, I think they designed some things at their house at one house they designed. He made that mistake of doing a bunch of stuff to it <laughs> to mm -hmm. kind of customize it to himself a little bit. And then when it's all said and done, it's like, well, you kind of like it, but then you're just like, oh, yeah, this was not really a smart move, but uh, <laughs> from a financial perspective, because yeah. now, well, but they didn't go for counter raising or things like that, because I think that's a pretty universal size height kind of deal. But I'm like you, I would have asked for six inches taller myself. Yeah, at work, they actually did something for me. I actually, I actually asked for an accommodation. <laughs> mm, at the <laughs> I said, register. Can I, can I can I raise my yeah? I said, can I raise this thing up? Um, because mm -hmm. I if it's busy, I'm bent like that dishes like thing all day. And that kills me at the end of the day. But I raised that thing about four inches and dude, my life's been great so, mm -hmm. <laughs> since I did that at work. Yeah, I guess if you're going to stay in the house for the rest of your life, then it makes sense. But yeah. if it's an investment property, then probably not the best idea. I guess so, but well, later on. Brood said, your daughter is killing you. Why? The Mibe glanced across at Corlat, whose expression was distraught. After a moment, the Mibe returned her gaze to Caladan Brood and said, Silver Fox is of Talon, of the Talan I mass, warlord. They have no life force to give her. They are kin, yet can offer no sustenance, for they are undead, whilst their new child is flesh and blood. Tattersail too is dead, as was Nightchill. Kinship is more important than you might think. Blood-bound lives are the web that carries each of us. They make up that which a life climbs, from newborn to child, then child to adulthood. Without such life forces, one withers and dies. To be alone is to be ill, warlord, not just spiritually, but physically as well. I am my daughter's web, and I am alone in that. I think this point is most prudent, especially in an era where many people feel more isolated than ever before. With the exception of the lone wolf archetype, most people probably do better in finding people in the real world to connect with. Yeah, I agree. Because we're pretty much built, I feel, to have connections. We're a social animal. Even someone like me who is more of an introvert, mm -hmm. I still like to be around people. Yeah. It's the old Randall from Clerks. You know, it's, I love parties, but I hate people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brood was shaking his head. He said, your explanation does not answer her impatience, Mibe. She claims she will command the Talani Mass. She claims they have heard her summons. Does this not in turn mean that the undead armies have already accepted her? Corlat said, Warlord, you believe Silver Fox seeks to hasten her own growth in order to confirm her authority when she comes face to face with the Talani Mass? The undead armies will reject a child summoner. Is this your belief? Brood said, I am seeking the reason for what she's doing to her mother, Corlat. The Mibe said, You might well be correct, Warlord. Bone and flesh can hold only so much power. The limit is always finite. For such beings as you and Anamander Rake, and you too, Corlat, you possess the centuries of living necessary to contain what you command. Silver Fox does not, or rather her memories tell her she does, yet her child's body denies those memories. Thus, vast power awaits her, and to fully command it, she must be a grown woman. And even then, Corlat said, ascendancy is born of experience. An interesting notion, Maeb. I believe we've circled this topic before, wondering if it was simply a matter of time before anyone could attain ascendancy. If I read the Mibes theory correctly, it's almost like building your strength over a lifetime through use, similar to quote unquote farmer strength. This kind of makes sense to me in that context. Yeah, I think that that does make a lot of sense. But what about Perrin though? He's just kind of thrown into this. Isn't he? It certainly feels that way. Yeah. I guess with Perrin, the problem is with his, he's, he needs to learn how to kind of let go. But how do you get someone to let go and try to master something they don't have any familiarity with they never saw it? Because with a magic user, the people that I think of normally seeking ascendancy in my mind would be someone that's looking, you know, they're questing for power. 
in some way or maybe not to exploit others with, but these people are powerful people. I don't know if they're seeking power for power's end or what, but Perrin has just been thrust into this. I'm not trying to seek out powers, but all of a sudden I've got something going on I can't explain. <laughs> yeah, with Perrin, it's almost like Neo in the Matrix where he has to start believing. Yeah. He's denying <laughs> yeah, it right true. now. Yeah. And it's it's really hurting him. Yeah, okay. That's very true. <laughs> nice. <laughs> He's beginning to believe. Now I gotta go watch that series again. You understand what you do to me with that. It's like I've got to watch. You don't just talk about the Matrix and then not expect me to go watch some kung fu fighting. <laughs> mm -hmm. I watched one and two recently. It's hard for me to start the third one. I know. I don't do. I, I do the same. I watch one and two all day, every day. I got no problem. It's, it's number. I don't want to. It's because number three degenerates into that weird, like Lord of the Rings, <laughs> yeah. war movie. It's like, wait, what? It's like, yeah. And it has the spice orgy. That's in two. Oh, that's two. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's at the beginning of two. But I think for me, it's just like the gangster movies. I like the come up. I don't like Ish. watching the downfall. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly, dude. <laughs> I, I like it all lift, all up, baby. That's me. Yeah. I love the beginning of the Goodfellas. I don't like it when he starts getting into oh, drugs, dude, cheating on his wife, all that kind of stuff. That everything starts falling apart. First time I saw Goodfellas, I thought for the first half of that movie, it's like, I want to be a gangster. It's like... <laughs> I was like, no, 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 now I don't want to be. It's like, no. That's like, <laughs> the Mibe nodded and said, and experience tempers. Brood rumbled, thus Kalor's fear, untempered power. Corlat said, it may be that Kalor himself is the cause of the child's impatience. She seeks to become a woman in order to alleviate his fears. My perspective on this would be Kalor probably wants her dead before she gets those powers. Yeah. <laughs> Strike he doesn't her want down. her to have him at all. <laughs> Strike her down now before she gains her powers. That's right. Yeah. While you have a chance. Yeah. Brood muttered, I doubt he'd appreciate the irony. Alleviate, you said? Thinking on it, more likely she knows she'll have to defend herself against him sooner or later. Corlat murmured, a secret hovers between them. There was silence. All knew the truth of that, and all were troubled. After a long moment, Brood cleared his throat and said, Life experiences the child possesses those, does she not, Mibe? The three Malazan mages. The Mibe smiled wearily and said, A Thelomen, two women, and myself, one father and three reluctant mothers to the same child. The father's presence seems so faint that I have begun to suspect it exists only as Nightchill's memory. As for the two women, I am seeking to discover who they were, and what I have learned thus far of Tattersail comforts me. Corlat asked, And Nightchill? Brood interjected, Did not Rake kill her at Pale? Corlat said, no, Nightchill was ambushed, betrayed by the high mage Tashrin. We have been informed that Tashrin has since fled back to the Empress. This last statement is the first clarification we get on what exactly happened to Nightchill during that battle, specifically where the demon that killed her came from. And it has been a long time coming. Yeah. I mean, I think we knew this, it was spelled out, but not actually acknowledged by anybody from Rake's camp. But no, that was Tashrin, dude. <laughs> Yeah, nothing to do with that. Yeah, I don't think it's been explicitly stated that he summoned it. Yeah, it was really uh, speculation, but it was felt that we, yeah, felt that, that that was the case. And yeah, it's nice to have it actually affirmed here. Mm -hmm. It's wild to see all this stuff come together, isn't it? I love it. Yeah, that's part of the fun of rereading stuff, yeah. picking up the stuff as you go through. Yeah. Corlat faced the Mibe again and said, what have you learned of her? The Mibe reluctantly replied, I have seen flashes of darkness within Silver Fox, which I would attribute to Nightchill a seething anger, a hunger for vengeance, possibly against Tatrin. At some time, perhaps soon, there will be a clash between Tattersail and Nightchill. The victor will come to dominate my daughter's nature. Brood was silent for a half dozen breaths, then said, what can we do to aid this Tattersail? The Mibe said, the Malazans are seeking to do that very thing, warlord. Much rests on their efforts. We must have faith in them, in Whiskey Jack, and in Captain Perrin, the man who was once Tattersail's lover. Corlat said, I have spoken with Whiskey Jack. He possesses an unshakable integrity, warlord, an honorable man. Brood said, I hear your heart in your words. Corlat shrugged and said, less cause to doubt me then, Caladan. I am not careless in such matters. Brood grunted, then Riley said, I dare not take another step in that direction. Mibe, hold close to your daughter. Should you begin to see the spirit of Nightchill rising and that of Tattersail's setting, inform me at once. The Mibe thought, and should that occur, my telling you will see my daughter killed. Brood went on. My thoughts are not settled on that matter. Rather, such an event may well lead to my more directly supporting the Malazans in their efforts on Tattersail's behalf. The Mibe raised her brows. She asked, 
Precisely how, Warlord? Brood said, have faith in me. The Mib sighed, then nodded. She said, very well. I shall so inform you. The tent flap was drawn back and Hurlikel entered. He said, Warlord, the Darugistan contingent approached our camp. Brood said, let us go to meet them then. Oh boy, are you ready for this? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't know well, if I'm ready for that. Uh, you may not be, but let's just, just we, we got to get into it, so you might as well just get into it. <laughs> Ain't no way through it, but through it. Yeah. Since arriving, the hooded driver seemed to have fallen asleep. The huge, ornate carriage's double doors opened from within, and a regent blue slippered foot emerged. Arrayed before the carriage and its train of six jewel decked horses in a crescent were the representatives of the two allied armies, Dujek, Whiskey Jack, Twist, and Captain Perrin to the left, and Caladan Brood, Kalor, Corlat, Silver Fox, and the Mibe to the right. The Reavy matron had been left exhausted by the events of the night just past, and her meeting with Brood had added yet more layers of weariness. The holding back on so much in the face of the warlord's hard questions had been difficult, yet she felt necessary. Her daughter's meeting with Perrin had been far more strained and uncertain than the Mibe had suggested to Brood, nor had the intervening hours since then diminished the awkwardness of the situation. Worse, the reunion may have triggered something within Silver Fox. The child had drawn heavily on the Mibe since then, stripping away year after year from her mother's failing life. She thought, is it Tattersail behind the fevered demand on my life spirit or night chill? This will end soon. I yearn for the release of the hooded one's embrace. Silver Fox has allies now. They will do what is necessary. I am certain of it. Please, spirits of the Reavy, make me certain of it. The time for me is surely past, yet those around me continue to make demands of me. No, I cannot go on. The slippered foot probed daintily downward, <laughs> wavering until it touched ground. A rather plump calf, knee, and thigh followed. The short, round man who emerged was wearing silks of every color, the effect one of clashing discord. A shimmering, crimson handkerchief was clutched in one pudgy hand, rising to dab a glittering forehead. Both feet finally on the ground, the Daru loosed a loud sigh. Burns fiery heart, but it's hot! Brood stepped forward and said, Welcome, representative of the city of Darujistan, to the armies of liberation. I am Kaladan Brood, and this is Dujek One-Arm. The short, round man blinked myopically, mopped his brow once again, then beamed a smile. He said, Representative of the city of Darujistan? Indeed! None better, Krupp <laughs> says, though he be a lowly citizen, a curious commoner come to cast kindly eyes upon this momentous occasion. Krupp is suitably honored by your formal, nay, respectful welcome. What vast <laughs> display, Krupp wonders, will you formidable warriors unveil when greeting the Council of Darujistan's official representatives? The sheer escalation now imminent has Krupp's heart all a patter with anticipation. Look on to the south, the counselor's carriage even now approaches. <laughs> it has been over a year since I had to read Krupp dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to count my blessings in that year. <laughs> I want to say it's been a real joy to not read Krupp. Oh, good golly. He always gets me laughing about something or another just because of the show he puts on. I just always imagine there's just this whole, his whole who he is that we learn is just an act. The sweaty fat guy. Mm -hmm. You know, other than being fat, is he even fat? <laughs> good question. It's an illusion. Is it an illusion? <laughs> is he just, you know, what's going on here with Krupp? I don't know. And I, I don't think we'll ever know. We'll be infuriated. But, oh my word, I look forward to what's going to go on here, though, with this meeting, because this is some power. <laughs> it's like dropping. It's not quite as anarchic as Bugs Bunny showing up at the meeting, but, you know, <laughs> it's it's kind of along the lines. You know, he's an instigator a little bit, but he's not that bad of an instigator, but he's just he's a squirrel. It's not even a squirrel. There's a plan behind everything he does. Oh, my word. Not, yeah, he's not squirrely. He's, it, it's just all that. It's it always looks squirrely. It's not. It's just it's his magic. I'm guessing. Is that what it is? Is he an ascendant? It's like, did we ask this question? I don't even know if there's magic involved with the way he confounds people. I think he is just that skilled at that. Yes, he's like a an ultimate trial lawyer. <laughs> F. Lee Krupp. <laughs> Good golly, I think you've got, I think you're onto something there, sir. But he does that. They did mention magics, though. I think the boy, I mean, he's he, he has the neck of dragons in his head. That means he has some affinity, at least towards it. Kind of like a fiddler, in a way, would you think? 
an adept, not quite an, a user, but is that, what, is that what an adept is? I think he's even above an adept. He is okay. something else. He is definitely, I feel, some type of ascendant. But I just had a flash of genius. That's our next Malazan TV show, The Courts of Darujistan. Oh, dude. With Krupp. <laughs> It's the Judge Judy with Krupp, yeah. <laughs> no, he's a lawyer, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. And, and you can imagine every Some judge. Some frustrated like, oh, judge. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Who's representing Krupp? Oh, no. <laughs> That'd be amazing. I would love to see the slow pan as the foot <laughs> comes out and just, like, probing carefully. I know it. The reveal of the calf oh. and not knowing at all what to expect it would be hilarious. Oh, I know it. Cause this could be drawn out for about 20 or 30 seconds easily before we even get to the face. It easily. <laughs> Crone's cackle spilled into the silence following Krupp's pronouncements. Despite her fraught warning emotions, the Mibe smiled and thought, Oh yes, of course I know this man. She stepped forward, unable to resist herself. As she said, I have been in your dreams, sir. Krupp's eyes fixed on her and widened in alarm. He mopped his brow and said, my dear, while all things are possible, <laughs> Crone cackled a second time. The Mibe added, I was younger then, and with child. We were in the company of a bone caster and an elder god. Recognition lit his round, flushed face, followed swiftly by dismay. For once he seemed at a loss for words. His gaze held on hers a moment longer, then dropped to the child at her side. She noted his narrowing eyes and thought, he senses the way of things between us. Instantly. How? And why is it I know the truth of my conviction? How profound is this link? I think with Krupp this time, we see something different from him. Concern. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he had concern in gardens, but it was hidden and it was linked and tied up to his love for his city versus this is different. I feel a profound sadness almost at the, when he, that recognition to get him to shut up. That's profound. <laughs> Agreed. Brood cleared his throat and said, Welcome, Citizen Krupp. We are now aware of the events surrounding the birth of the child, Silver Fox. You, then, are the mortal involved. The identity of this elder god, however, remains unknown to us. Which one? The answer to that question may well do much to determine our relationship with the girl. Krupp blinked up at Brood. He patted the soft flesh beneath his chin with the silk cloth and said, Krupp understands. Indeed, he does. A sudden tension permeates this prestigious gathering, yes? The god in question, yes, hmm. Ambivalence, uncertainty, all anathema to Krupp of Darujistan. Possibly then, again, possibly not. He glanced over his shoulder as the official delegation's carriage approached and mopped his brow again. He said, swift answers may well mislead. Nay, give the wrong impression entirely. Oh my, what to do? Someone yelled, damn you! The cry <laughs> came from the other carriage driver as the ornate contrivance arrived. The shouting continued, Krupp, what in Hood's name are you doing here? Krupp pivoted and attempted a sweeping bow, which, despite its meager success, nevertheless managed to seem elegant. He said, Dear friend Marilio, have you climbed in the world with this new profession, or perhaps sidled sideways? <laughs> Krupp was unaware of your obvious talents in leading mules. <laughs> Marilio scowled, then said, Seems the council's select train of horses inexplicably vanished moments before our departure. Horses decidedly similar to ones you and me seem to have acquired, might I add. Krupp said, extraordinary coincidence, friend Marilio. <laughs> That's amazing. He stole the horses meant for the counselors. <laughs> Would you expect anything else from this man? <laughs> oh, hilarious. I have that. You know, it's funny. Now that he's here, it's like I was kind of almost not looking forward to it. It's like, thank God, I'm kind of glad to see Krupp. <laughs> This section in particular does a really uh, good job of bringing uh, him back because oh, it's absolutely hilarious. It's masterful, dude. It's just so masterful. The carriage doors opened and out climbed a broad-shouldered, balding man. His blunt-featured face was dark with anger as he strode towards Krupp. Krupp spread his arms wide even as he involuntarily stepped back. He said, dearest friend and lifelong companion, welcome, <laughs> Counselor Call. Cool. And who is that behind you? Why, none other than Counselor Estrasian Darl. In such fashion, all the truly vital representatives of fair Darujistan are thus gathered. I hate to say this and interrupt so quickly, but dude, last we saw of Cole, he was not a counselor. No. He was still drunk, wasn't he? He was recovering from a wound to the leg that almost killed him. Did he say bye to Perrin in the epilogue of Gardens of the Moon? I seem to recall some kind of like little parting between the two soldiers, kind of like. Perrin learned some valuable lesson about just kind of chilling and being 
where you are in the moment with Cole. The last we see is before all the shenanigans kick off. Okay. That's kind of what I was thinking. I thought there might have been like a little farewell between him and him, but yeah, it's, it's a complete reversal of fortune since we've last seen Cole. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, he got all his stuff back apparently, and he's yeah. in good standing in the community again. Yeah, right on. So the gambit paid off. Yes, it did. The sting worked. <laughs> Cole growled, excluding you, Krupp, still advancing on the man who was now backpedaling to his own carry. (laughs) Krupp exclaimed, untrue, friend Cole. I am here as representative of Master Baruch. Cole hesitated. He crossed his burly arms and said, oh, indeed, the alchemist sent you on his behalf, did he? Krupp said, well, not in so many words, of course. Baruch and I are of such closeness and friendship that words are often unnecessary. (laughs) How Krupp ask. <laughs> Call said, enough, Krupp, and turned to Brood. He said, my deepest apologies, Warlord. I am Call, and this gentleman at my side is Estrasian Darl. We are here on behalf of the ruling council of Daruzistan. The presence of this, this Krupp, was unintended and indeed unwelcome. If you can spare me a moment, I will send him on his way. Brood said, alas, it seems we have need of him. Rest assured, I will explain. For now, however, perhaps we should reconvene in my command tent. Call swung a glare on Krupp and asked, What outrageous lies have you uttered now? <laughs> Krupp looked offended. He said, Krupp and the truth are lifelong partners, friend Call. Indeed, <laughs> wedded bliss. We only yesterday celebrated our 40th anniversary, the mistress of veracity and I. Krupp is most certainly of need in all things, at all times, and in all places. It is a duty Krupp must accept. Howsoever, humbly, with a low growl, Call raised a hand to cuff the man. Imagine how this must appear to Brood. At least the Malazans have been exposed to Krupp a little bit, so probably knew what to yeah. expect. Kind of an inoculation, as it were. <laughs> yeah, Brood. Fortunately, Brood's a pretty chill fella. From what we've seen, he's a pretty relaxed man. Pretty low stress. I'm guessing carrying that weight on your back, you got to be kind of like pretty chill. Yeah. Estrasian Darl stepped forward and laid a hand on Call's shoulder. He murmured, be at ease. It appears to be obvious to all that Krupp does not speak for anyone but Krupp. We are not responsible for him. If in truth he is to prove useful, the task of impressing us falls upon him and him alone. Krupp cried, and impress I shall. Crone bounded down to hop towards Krupp. She shouted, you, sir, should have been a great raven. He shouted back, and you a dog. (laughs) Crone halted, teetered a moment, wings half spreading. She cocked her head and whispered, a dog? Krupp said, only so that I might ruffle you behind the ears, my dear. Crone said, ruffle? Ruffle? Krupp said, very well, not a dog then. A parrot? Crone (laughs) said, a parrot. (laughs) Krupp cried, perfect. Brood roared, enough! All of you, follow me. He whirled and stomped toward the Tistandi encampment. (laughs) It took only a glance from the Mibe to start Whiskey Jack laughing. Dujak joined him a moment later than the others. Silver Fox squeezed her hand and said, Krupp has already revealed his value, don't you think? The Mibe said, aye, child, that he has. Come, we'd best lead the way in catching up with the Warlord. I'll tell you what, Krupp and Crone are going to push Brood to the limit of his patience. Yeah, and Krupp could sure test the patience of stone. (laughs) But I just love how, just the fact that he gets in here and just insinuates himself into this like proceeding of like, it's kind of like Forrest Gump showing up at like a meeting of the League of Nations or something, you know, where they've got the fates of the world is at stake and he shows up, just kind of like forces himself to a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Who is this guy? (laughs) We're familiar with him, but we still don't know who this guy is. And if you want to be honest, (laughs) he's the eel. (laughs) As soon as all were within the command tent and the removal of cloaks and weapons had begun, Perrin strode over to Counselor Call and said, It is good to see you again, though you wore a soldier's armor with more ease, I think, than those robes. Call grimaced and said, You're right enough in that. Do you know I at times think back on that night camped in the Gadrobi Hills with something like nostalgia? We weren't anything but ourselves then. He met Perrin's eyes with a flicker of worry at what he saw. They gripped hands. He said, Simpler times. Whiskey Jack joined them and said, an unlikely toast, an earthenware jug in one hand. He said, there's tankers there behind you, counselor, on what passes for a table. Brood has no servants as such, so I've elected myself to that worthy task. Pulling three tankards close, Perrin frowned at the table. He said, this is the bed of a wagon. You can still see the straw. Whiskey Jack said, which also explains this place smelling like a stable. Brood's map table went missing last night. Call raised an eyebrow. He asked, someone stole a table? Whiskey Jack replied, not someone, and glanced at Perrin, then said, you're bridge burners, Captain. I'd lay a column on it. Perrin asked, what in Hood's name for? (laughs) 
Whiskey Jack said, that's something you'll have to find out. Fortunately, the warlord's only complaint was at the inconvenience. Brood's deep voice rose then. If one and all will find seats, we can get to the business of supply and materiel. Krupp was the first to lower himself into a chair at the head of the makeshift table. <laughs> he held a tankard and a handful of Reevee sweet cakes. He said, such rustic environs and traditional pastries of the plains to lure the palate. More, this ale is most delicious, perfectly cooled. Call growled, be quiet, damn you. And what are you doing in that chair? Krupp said, why sitting, friend Call? <laughs> Our mutual friend, the alchemist, Call interrupted, would skin you alive if he knew you were here, claiming to represent him. Krupp's brows rose and he nearly choked on a mouthful of sweet cake, spraying crumbs as he coughed. He quickly drank down his ale, then belched. He said, by the abyss, what a distasteful notion and entirely an error, Krupp assures everyone. Baruch has a keen interest in the smooth conduct of this prestigious gathering of legendary persons. The success of the venture impending is uppermost in his mind, and he pledges to do all that is within his and his servant Krupp's formidable abilities. Brood asked, has your master specific suggestions? Krupp said, innumerable suggestions of a specific nature, Sir Warlord. So many that, when combined, they can only be seen or understood in the most general terms. He then lowered his tone and continued, vague and seemingly vacuous generalities are proof of Master Baruch's all-embracing endeavors. Krupp sagely points out, but please let us get underway lest this meeting stretch on, forcing the delivery of a sumptuous supper replete with the driest of wines to wet the gullet and such a selection of sweets as to leave Krupp groaning in fullest pleasure. Wow. Call muttered, gods forbid. <laughs> Estrazian Darl cleared his throat then said, we are faced with only minor difficulties in maintaining a supply route to your combined armies, Warlord and Dujek One Arm. The most pressing of these centers on the destroyed bridge west of Daruzhistan. There are but few manageable crossings of the Catlin River, and the destruction of that stone bridge by the Jagut tyrant has created an inordinate amount of difficulty. Krupp raised a pudgy finger and said, Ah, but are not bridges not but a means of traveling from one side of a river to another? Does this not assume certain prerequisites regarding the projected plans of movement as directed by the leaders of the armies? Krupp is left wondering. He reached for another sweet cake. After a moment, Darl said, as are we all. Dujek, his eyes narrowed on Krupp, cleared his throat and said, well, much as I hate to admit it, there's something in that. He swung his gaze to Estrasian and said, Catlin River only presents a problem if we look to employing the south routes, and we'd only want those if the army seek to cross early in the march. Both counselors frowned. Brood added, it is our intent to remain north of the river, to march directly towards Kapustan. Our route will take us north of Saltoan, well north, then proceed in a southeast direction. Call spoke. You describe a direct route to Kapistan, sir, for your forces. Such a route will, however, strain our efforts at maintaining supply. We will not be able to deliver via the river. An overland train of such magnitude will sorely test our capabilities. Darl added, it must be understood that the council must needs deal with private enterprises in fulfilling your supply needs. Krupp cried, such delicacy! The issues, martial comrades, are these. The Council of Daruzhistan consists of various noble houses, of which virtually one and all possess interests in mercantile endeavors. Discounting the potentially confusing reality of the Council's providing vast loans to your armies with which you will in turn purchase supplies from the Council, the particular nature of the redistribution of said wealth is paramount to specific members of the Council. The vying, the back chamber deals and conniving, well, one would be hard-pressed to imagine such a nightmarish tangle of weights, measures, wefts, and webs, dare Krupp say. The instructions delivered to these two worthy representatives are no doubt manifest, not to mention a veritable skein of conflicting commands. The counselors here before you are thus constrained by a knot that not even the gods could disentangle. It falls to Krupp, lowly but worthy citizen of fair Daruzhistan, to propose his and Master Baruch's solution. Man, he is long-winded. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. He could have wrapped that up in about two sentences. Yeah. <laughs> I told you before I came here, I get frustrated sometimes. He doesn't bother me because he's part of the show. Krupp does. But uh, like when people are like this in real life, I become highly frustrated with people that don't get to the point. And I dealt with some of that, like this meeting that went on today. These It went on for an hour. With, it could have been wrapped up and surmised in about two sentences. 
and I was just getting so frustrated. I mean, I, I think I was becoming, I think the people on the stage could see how visibly frustrated I was, but just get to the point for goodness sake, just tell us. You know? And so I get so frustrated with that kind of stuff in real life. How does your agitation manifest itself physically? Is your knee shaking? Uh, or you know, Not yet. You it's, it starts off, it starts off with the, like the rolling of the eyes and I'm looking at my wife and going, and then I'm just kind of like shaking the head, arms crossed, legs crossed, arms moving uncrossed, legs uncrossed. And it starts legs shifting to the other leg, crossing, crossing my arms differently. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> Visibly agitated in my chair. Wow. <laughs> I went into chairs in a pew, but it's like, oh, I was becoming visibly agitated though. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a malazin question here. Mm -hmm. Who do you think would speak longer if left to their own devices, Krupp or Calor? <laughs> uh, it, you know, I, I, I have to ask another question. <laughs> Cowell reminds me, there is a villain that's in the Doom Patrol, and, it, and he shows up in the television show, and it's really just a cockroach. But this cockroach is just spewing these apocalyptic things always about how he went on, the world will bow before me. It's just constantly, that's how I feel Caller constantly is. You know, in one way or another, I get, that's who Caller is to me. This is like, good gracious, just, I don't know though. Caller is different though. He would at least act somewhere. He's not just long-winded. He can act on his long-windedness. We don't see Kruppa act much. We see him test the patience of things. <laughs> we see him test the patience of ascendants that should not be able to have their patience tested by a lowly mortal like this guy. So mm -hmm. I don't know what to make of crap, dude. <laughs> he's a confounding, he is enigmatic. He's like the, one of the most enigmatic characters in the series in a weird way. One of the most verbose. <laughs> and for being, that, for being that verbose, he says nothing about himself or about anything. He just, <laughs> his, he just says nothing. <laughs> Yeah, he takes a while to get to whatever he's building up to. Yeah, I'm always like the English. It's like, get on with it. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> Call leaned forward and rubbed his eyes. He said, let's hear it then, Krupp. Krupp said, an impartial and exquisitely competent manager of said supply is required, of course. Not on the council and therefore possessing nothing of the internal pressures so afflicting its honorable members. Skilled as well in mercantile matters. A vast capacity for organizing. In all, a superior... Call's fist thumped down on the table, startling everyone. He rounded on Krupp and said, if you imagine yourself in, in such a role, you, a middling fence to middling pickpockets and warehouse thieves. <laughs> Krupp raised his hands and leaned back. He said, dear friend, Call, you flatter me with such an offer. However, poor Krupp is far too busy with his own middling affairs to tackle such an endeavor. Nay, in close consultation with his loyal and wise servant Krupp, Master Baruch proposes a different agent entirely. Call hissed, what is all this? Baruch doesn't even know you're here. Krupp <laughs> said, a minor breakdown in communication, nothing more. The alchemist's desire was plain to Krupp. He assures you one and all. Whilst Krupp may well and with some justification claim sole credit for the impending proposal, alas, he must bow to the virtue of truthfulness and therefore acknowledge Master Baruch's minor yet vital contribution. Why, it was only yesterday that he mused on the peculiar talents of the agent in question. And if this was not a hint as to his desires, then what, dear call, could it have been? <laughs> Darl grated, get on with it, sir. <laughs> Krupp said, Krupp delights in doing so, friend counselor. And by the way, how fares your daughter, Chalice? Has she indeed partaken of marriage nuptials with that hero of the fate? Krupp so regrets his missing that no doubt sumptuous event. Darl snapped, which has yet to occur. She is well, sir. My patience with you is growing very thin, Krupp. Krupp said, alas, I can only dream of thin. <laughs> Very well, the agent in question is none other than the newly arrived mercantile enterprise known as the Trigal Trade Guild. Beaming, he sat back, lacing his fingers together over his belly. Brood turned to Call and said, an enterprise I have never heard of. Call was frowning. He said, as Krupp said, newly arrived in Jerusalem, from the south, Ellengarth, I believe. We used them but once, a singularly difficult delivery of funds to Dujek One Arm. He looked to Darl, who shrugged, then spoke, they have made no bids regarding the contracts to supply the combined armies. Indeed, they have sent no representative to the meetings. That single use of them, Call mentioned, was a subcontract, I believe. He swung a scowl on Krupp and said, Given their obvious lack of interest, why would you, or rather Master Baruch, believe that this Trigal Trade Guild is amenable to participating, much less acting as mitigator? Krupp poured himself another tankard of ale, sipped, then smacked his lips appreciatively. He said, the Trigal Trade Guild does not offer bids for every other enterprise would be sure to greatly underbid them without even trying. In other words, they are not cheap. 
More exactly, their services demand a king's ransom generally. One thing you can be sure of, however, is that they will do precisely what they have been hired to do, no matter how uh, nightmarish the logistics. Cole's face darkened. He said, you've invested in them, haven't you, Krupp? So much for impartial advice. And Baruch has obviously nothing to do with you being here. You're acting on behalf of this Trigal Trade Guild, aren't you? Krupp said, Krupp assures, the conflict of interest is a matter of appearance only, friend Call. The truth is more precisely a convergence. The needs are evident here before us all, and so too is the means of answering them. Happy coincidence. Now Krupp would partake of more of these delicious grievy cakes whilst you discuss the merits of said proposal and no doubt reach the propitious inevitable conclusion. There is such audacity from Krupp here. I have to say, as much as I dreaded his return, it has been delightful and entertaining. I agree. It has been a refreshing break, but I like that we're not going to the trouble of reintroducing people. We just know who he is. And you're like, oh, good gracious. And he's already starting. He's already leveling up. Here he's already just like showing. He has mass, he's levered himself as this exactly what he is. The representative for the Trigal Trade Commission. <laughs> <laughs> right here to make a killing and make a bunch of money but you know to make sure you guys are treated fairly at the same time kind of you're going to pay a king's fortune for it but you know you'll be treated fairly yeah outside the tent crone could smell sorcery in the air she thought and it doesn't belong no not tistandi not the reavy spirits awakened either she circled over the encampment questing with all her senses the afternoon had drawn into dusk then night as the meeting within caladan brood's command tent stretched on and on Crone was quickly bored by interminable discussions of caravan routes and how many tons of this and that were required on a weekly basis to keep two armies fed and content on the march. Granted, that repugnant creature Krupp was amusing enough, in the manner that an obese rat trying to cross a rope bridge was worth a cackle or three. <laughs> what a visual that is. That is a funny visual to imagine that. That is almost precisely how you can view Krupp. <laughs> A finely honed mind dwelt beneath the smeared, grotesque affectations Crone well knew, and Krupp's ability at earning his seat at the head of the table and of confounding the flailing counselors of Daruzistan was most certainly an entertaining enough display of deafness, until Crone had sensed the stirrings of magic somewhere in the camp. She thought, there, that large tent directly below. I know it. The place where the Reavy dressed the Tistandi dead. Crooking her wings, she dropped in a tight spiral. She landed a few paces from the entrance. The flap was drawn shut, tightly tied, but the leather thongs and their knots were poor obstacles for Crone's sharp beak. In moments she was within, hopping silently and unseen beneath the huge table, a table she recognized with a silent chuckle. I would love to see a scene with Crone undoing the knot, almost like those puzzles that people have crows and ravens solve to get treats out of. Yeah, and what's funny that you mentioned that, I've only recently discovered that little fun bit of internet video, crows and ravens doing things like that. I'm like, wow, because I knew that they were smart, but to see them figure things like that, it's kind of wild, dude. Yeah, using sticks of different length to manipulate things and yeah. move things. To, yeah, it's crazy. It's wild, dude. Four figures leaned on the table above her, whispering and muttering. The muted clatter of wooden cards echoed through to Crone, and she cocked her head. Picker said, there it is again. You sure you shuffled the damn thing, Spin? Spindle said, will you? Of course I did, Corporal. Stop asking me. Look, four times now. Different laying of the fields, everyone. And it's simple. Obelisk dominates. The dolmen of time is the core. It's active, plain as day. The first time in decades. Another voice said, could still be that untoward skew. You ain't got Fid's natural hand, Spin. Picker interrupted, enough of that, Hedge. Spindle's done enough readings to be the real thing, trust me. Hedge said, didn't you just? Picker said, shut up. Spindle muttered, besides, I told you already, the new card's got a fixed influence. It's the glue holding everything together, and once you see that, it all makes sense. Another voice emerged, a woman's. She said, the glue, you said. Linked to a new ascendant, you think? Spindle said, beats me, Blend. I said a fixed influence, but I didn't say I knew the aspect of that influence. I don't know and not because I'm not good enough. It's like it hasn't woken up yet. A passive presence for the moment. Nothing more than that. When it does awaken, well, things should heat up nicely, is my guess. Picker said, so what are we looking at here, mage? Spindle said, same as before. Soldier of High House Death's right hand to obelisk. Mage Eye of Shadows here. First time for that one, too. A grand deception's at work, is my guess. The captain of High House Light holds out some hope but it's shaded by Hood's Herald, though not directly. There's a distance there, I think. The assassin of High House Shadow seems to have acquired a new face. I'm getting hints of it. Bloody familiar, that face. 
Do you have any guesses here with any of this? No, I'm not particularly good at when they mention this stuff with the deck of dragons. A lot of times I kind of just let it kind of roll over me. So uh, yeah, I have no idea. I was guessing that Obelisk is Perrin. Okay. The Soldier of Death, I was guessing Whiskey Jack, maybe. Okay. Then I guess theoretically it could be Fiddler too, because I think they were both Barrow yes, Masons. Stone Masons. And then the Magi of Shadow is Quick Ben. Yeah. I have no idea who the Captain of High House Light would be. And then Hood's Herald, again, no idea. Right. And then we'll get back to the Assassin of Shadow. Yeah, because it could be, there's two in, in my mind that it could be. I wonder about Absalar. <laughs> As the Assassin of Shadow? Yeah. Well, I mean, it says it in like two sentences. That's true. Hedge grunted and said, should bring Quick Ben in on this. Spindle hissed, that's it. The Assassin's face. It's Kalam. And I think that's cool that Kalam's the Assassin yeah. of Shadow now, which is interesting. I like that. Yeah, me too. I agree. Yeah, I guess that makes sense given what happens throughout Dead House Gates. Yeah. Hedge growled, bastard. I'd suspected as much. Him and Fid paddling off the way they did. You know what this means, don't you? Pigger said, we can guess. But the other thing's clear, Spin, isn't it? Spindle said, aye. Seven Cities is about to rise. May have already. The whirlwind. Hood must be smiling right now. Smiling something fierce. Hedge muttered, I got some questions for Quick Ben, don't I just? Spindle said, you should ask him about the new card, too, if you don't mind crawling. Let him take a look. Spindle said, aye. Crone thought, a new card of the Deck of Dragons? She cocked her head up farther, thinking furiously. New cards were trouble, especially ones with power. The House of Shadow was proof enough of that. Her eyes, one then as she further cocked her head, the other, slowly focused. Her mind dragged back from its abstracted realm, fixing at last on the underside of the table to find a pair of human eyes, the paint glittering as if alive, staring back down at her. And talk about a jump scare for her. Oh, that would be great to see, to see, have a camera cut to it and all of a sudden see that boom right in your face. Just like, uh -huh. oh, that would be a great jump scare. That would yeah. scare the audience, dude. That'd make everyone jump. <laughs> I love the detail about her not being able to see the card with both eyes at the same time. <laughs> Growing up, whenever our parrots would look at something on the floor, they would always cock their head to the side and give it the side eye. Yeah. Their eyes are so wide apart. It's funny. It is wild. How, you know, I like how they capture that, too. They, how Erickson captures that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Mibe stepped out of the tent, her mind befuddled with exhaustion. Silver Fox had fallen asleep in her chair during one of Krupp's rambling accounts describing yet another peculiarity of the Trigal Trade Guild's rules of contract, and the Mibe had decided to let the child be. In truth, she longed for some time away from her daughter. A pressure was building around Silver Fox, an incessant need that, moment by moment, was taking over more of the Mibe's life spirit. Of course, this feeble attempt at escape was meaningless. The demand was boundless, and no conceivable distance could affect a change. Her flight from the tent, from her daughter's presence, held naught but symbolic meaning. Heron emerged from the tent and approached. He said, I would ask you something, Mibe, then I shall leave you in peace. She thought, oh, you poor, savaged man. What would you have me answer? She asked, what do you wish to know, Captain? Perrin stared out at the sleeping camp and said, if someone wished to hide a table. <laughs> <laughs> she blinked and smiled and said, you will find them in the tent of the shrouds. It is unfrequented for the moment. Come, I shall take you there. He said, directions will suffice. The Mibe interrupted, walking eases the aches, Captain, this way. She made her way between the first of the tent rows. After a moment, she said, You have stirred Tattersail awake. As a dominant personality for my daughter, I think I am pleased by the development. He said, I'm glad for that, Mibe. She asked, What was the sorceress like, Captain? He said, Generous, perhaps to a fault. A highly respected and indeed well-liked cadre mage. She thought, Oh, sir, you hold so much within yourself, chained and in darkness. Detachment is a flaw, not a virtue. Don't you realize that? Do you think this is his noble upbringing that is causing him to hold so much within himself? Or is it more his experiences since he took on the assignment with Lorne? You know, I think it's a little of both, of course. But I'm assuming the detachment, though, that probably just comes from that uh, being, being noble born is kind of my assumption. You know, I always, I, I always look at the English very stiff upper lip, you know, no matter what's going on, you know, you're just, you know, men are to keep it together no matter what and that's kind of what i'm seeing here originally i was thinking that it was that upbringing but then i remembered what he was like how lippy he was with lorne initially yeah. and i was thinking that's okay true. i think he learned to keep his mouth shut when he sat with call around the campfire yeah when he realized that 
sometimes being quiet said more than spewing all this stuff out that people didn't want to hear. You know, that's actually in the Proverbs. <laughs> about a fool is seemed as being correct by keeping his mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> Something makes you look a lot smarter than you than you yeah. are if you just be quiet. Yeah, just quiet you're wise yeah. you're just thinking about things exactly <laughs> cogitating the mentat calculation engine <laughs> perrin went on you might well have viewed from your Revi perspective the malazan forces on this continent as some kind of unstoppable relentless monster devouring city after city but it was never like that Poorly supplied, often outnumbered, in territories they had no familiarity with. By all accounts, one arms host was being chewed to pieces. The arrival of Brood, the Tistandi, and the Crimson Guard stopped the campaign in its tracks. The cadre mages were often all that stood between the host and annihilation. The Mibe said, yet they had the Maranth. Perrin said, aye, though not as reliable as you might think. Nonetheless, their alchemical munitions have changed the nature of warfare, not to mention the mobility of their quarrels. The host has come to rely heavily on both. And what a force multiplier they turned out to be. Mm, absolutely. Taking over huge chunks of a continent lickety split. Yes. The Mibe said, ah, I see faint lantern glow coming from the shroud. There, directly ahead. There have been rumors that all was not well with the Maranth. Perrin shot her a glance, then shrugged and said, a schism has occurred, triggered by a succession of defeats weathered by their elite forces, the gold. At the moment, we have the black at our side, and none other, though the blue continue on the sea lanes to seven cities. That does not bode well. The gold lost to Caladan Brood's forces, if I recall. We learned about that in Gardens of the Moon. Jorik's sharp lance from the Crimson Guard led the forces to victory in that battle. Okay, I remember that being mentioned. Kalor was not speaking highly of Jorik's sharp lance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> does he speak highly of anyone but himself? Good point. They were startled by the staggering appearance of Crone from the Shroud's flap. She reeled drunkenly, flopped onto her chest but three paces from the Maib and the Malazan. Crone's head jerked up, one eye fixing on Perrin. She hissed, You! Then spreading her vast wings, she sprang into the air. Heavy, savage thuds of her wings lifted her up into the darkness. A moment later, she was gone. Man, that table had quite an effect on her. She's drunk on the sorceress power emanating from it. Yeah. It's kind of funny, but it's also kind of troubling in a way because, you know, what we've learned about Crone, I wouldn't think something could make her feel like that unless it was something from some ascendant that she was devouring power from. You know, not a card in the deck of dragons. That's kind of wild. The Mibe glanced at Perrin, who was frowning. She murmured, Crone showed no sign of fearing you before. Janice Ooh. Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Perrin shrugged. Voices sounded from the shroud, and a moment later, figures began filing out, the lead one carrying a hooded lantern. Perrin growled, far enough. The woman with the lantern flinched, then thumped a wrong-handed salute. <laughs> she said, sir, we have just made a discovery. In this tent, sir. The purloined table has been found. <laughs> so that's how she's going to play it. Okay. Oh, that sounds like how I'd play it, unfortunately. <laughs> like, you know, I'm like, Dude, we just found what you were looking for, sir. It's like... <laughs> uh -huh. It's amazing. Perrin drawled, indeed. Well done, Corporal. You and your fellow soldiers have shown admirable diligence. <laughs> Picker said, thank you, sir. Perrin strode towards the tent. He said, it is within, you said? Picker said, yes, sir. Perrin said, well, military decorum insists we return it to the warlord at once. Wouldn't you agree, Picker? Picker said, absolutely, sir. Perrin paused and surveyed the soldiers, then said, hedge, spindle, blend, four and all. I trust you will be able to manage. Corporal Picker blinked. She asked, sir? Perrin clarified, carrying the table, of course. Picker said, uh, might I suggest we find a few more soldiers? Perrin said, I think not. We are departing in the morning, and I want the company well rested, so best not disturb their sleep. It shouldn't take the four of you more than an hour, I would judge, which will give you a few moments to spare readying your kits. Well, best not delay, Corporal. <laughs> hmm? It's amazing. I love how he handles this. That was brilliant, dude. I love it. Yeah. Picker said, yes, sir. Then glumly swung to her soldiers and commanded, dust up your hands. We've work to do. Spindle, you got a problem? Spindle was staring slack-jawed at Perrin. Picker said, Spindle? Spindle whispered, idiot. Picker shouted, soldier! Unfazed, Spindle said, how could I have missed it? It's him, as plain as can be. Picker stepped up and cuffed him. She shouted, snap out of it, damn you! Spindle stared at her, then scowled. Don't hit me again, or you'll regret it till the end of your days. 
Hager stood firm and said, the next time I hit you, soldier, you won't be getting up. Any more threats from you will be your last. Am I clear? <laughs> she knows how to handle insubordination. <laughs> oh, yes, she does. I wouldn't mess around with her. Nope. Spindle shook himself, eyes straying once more to Perrin, then whispered, everything will change. Can't happen yet. I need to think. Quick, Ben. Pigger shouted, Spindle! He flinched, then gave Pigger a sharp nod and said, pick up the table, I. Let's get to it, I, right away. Come on, Hedge. Blend. The Mib watched the four soldiers re-enter the shroud, then turned to Perrin. She asked, what was all that about, Captain? He replied, I have no idea. She said, that table needs more than four pairs of hands. Perrin said, I imagine it does. She said, yet you won't provide them. He glanced at her, then said, Hood, no. They stole the damn thing in the first place. <laughs> Love that scene. Stole it back. <laughs> stole it back. Yeah. But I think you can safely say it belongs to Caladan Brood now. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. A bell remained before the sun's rise, leaving Picker and her hapless crew to their task. And departing as well from the Mibe's presence, Perry made his way to the Bridgeburner encampment situated at the southwest edge of Brood's main camp. A handful of soldiers stood at sentry duty at the pickets, offering ragged salutes as he passed them. When does anybody ever sleep? I know. The bridge burners in particular stayed up two nights in a row. The first night they were gambling in that tent. Then yeah. tonight, the four of them were in there all night, it seems. I'm assuming these fellas are like our World War II fighter pilots. They're the birth of Hell's Angels and Speed. So <laughs> I'm assuming the bridge burners do a lot of meth. <laughs> A lot of speed amongst these guys because i mean yeah i'd say these guys never sleep they're either marching 19 hours or 20 hours a day and then spending the, the other three hours scrapping getting stuff ready for everyone else and then it's like okay time to do it again it's like wait they didn't get to sleep man yeah and the, the leaders all stayed up all night too yeah yeah no one's exempt <laughs> it's like no yeah. no one no one sleeps it's like yeah a bunch of speed freaks maybe it's the null maybe they can use the null to take away some of this and boost them i don't know but they need that caffeine worn yeah yeah the starbucks do. worn yeah yeah the starbucks worn there you go Perrin was surprised to find whiskey jack near the center hearth busy saddling a tall <laughs> chestnut oh gelding. my gosh i'm sorry is that what is <laughs> Imagine the Warren for crack. Oh, <laughs> oh no. What kind of beings would be in there? Minimum, it's like the, the like, they'd all be jacked up like honey badgers. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's, I've, I've read that that's nature's crackhead. It was the honey badger. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that, Going and after the guy, honey? Yeah. Just, they're just crazy, man. They don't care. Not just, they're, they're just, they have that attitude. They, they go after lions. They, they'll attack anything, anytime, anywhere. They don't care. They just don't care. They're just like out of their ever-loving minds. And they usually make those guys back down because they're so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen it too. Yeah. I think I saw a video the other day. It was four lionesses trying to get this honey badger. It's two of them. It's, yes, I've seen that. But that's the exact one I'm talking about. Is that where he yeah. latches on that guy's face at yeah. one point? It's like it's like if they turn around in their own skin and bite them in their face and that that lioness cannot let go of that thing fast enough you know, uh -huh. <laughs> it's like whoa whoa they're not and sure they, what to do yeah they eventually just walk off you know? yeah <laughs> it's yeah, not worth it no it's a, it call, they make you pay apparently but apparently they get killed quite a bit too because they're crazy yeah <laughs> they're just crazy i believe that and they're smart look at stossel oh god he's like the <laughs> raptors escaping the pen in jurassic park he's testing Always testing. <laughs> Always testing, dude. Some of the escape methods he used to get out of that enclosure were crazy. Dude, the, the tools left in there, he makes them into ladder, into ladders and climbs out. You're like, dude. Yeah. That's the, not, that's he not... made a mud ball and used that one time. <laughs> then they gave him a female. He used the female to help him <laughs> open the lock. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, my good gracious. That's too funny. Yeah, it's pretty. It makes oh, for great storytelling. It does make for good storytelling. Yeah. Perrin approached and asked, has the meeting concluded, sir? Whiskey Jack's glance was wry. He said, I am beginning to suspect it will never end if Kreppa has his way. <laughs> Perrin said, this trade guild of his has not gone down well then. Whiskey Jack said, to the contrary, it has been fully endorsed, though they'll cost <laughs> the council a king's ransom in truth. We have guarantees now ensuring the overland supply lines, precisely what we required. Perrin asked, why then does the meeting continue, sir? Whiskey Jack said, well, it seems that we'll have some envoys attached to our <laughs> army. Perrin said, not Krupp. Whiskey Jack <laughs> said, indeed, the worthy Krupp. And call. The worthy Krupp. I suspect he's eager to get out of those fancy robes and back into armor. 
Perrin said, aye, he would be. Whiskey Jack cinched the girth strap one last time, then faced Perrin. He seemed about to say one thing, then he hesitated and chose another. The Black Marath will take you and the bridge burners to the foot of the Bargast Range. Perrin's eyes widened. He said, that's quite a journey. And once there? Whiskey Jack said, once there, Trost detaches from your command. He's to initiate contact with the white-faced Bargast by whatever means he deems proper. You and your company are to provide his escort, but you will not become otherwise entangled in the negotiations. We need the white-faced clan. The entire clan. Perrin said, and Trotz will do the negotiating? Beru fend. Wissy Jack said, he's capable of surprising you, Captain. Perrin said, I see. Assuming he manages to succeed, we are then to proceed south? Wissy Jack nodded and said, to the relief of Kapustan, I." The commander set a boot within the stirrup and, with a wince, pulled himself up into the saddle. He gathered the reins, looking down on Perrin. He asked, any questions? Perrin glanced around, studying the sleeping camp, then shook his head. Whiskey Jack said, I'd offer you Opon's luck. Perrin said, no thank you, sir. Whiskey Jack <laughs> nodded. I've taken to wishing people success after we found it in these books. Luck is not a factor. Agreed. Success, I like that too. That's a good way of putting it. Because yeah. I don't believe in luck either. So mm-hmm. <laughs> I take that back. I say there's luck involved in games of chance. <laughs> That's mm. about the only time luck might be involved in. Craps, roulette, slots. Right, right. The gelding shied under Whiskey Jack suddenly, pitching to one side with a squeal of terror. Wind buffeted the camp, ripping the small tents from their shallow moorings. Voices shouted in alarm. Parents stared upward as a vast black shape swept towards the Tistandee encampment. A faint aura outlined the enormous draconian form to Perrin's eyes, silvery white and flickering. Perrin's stomach flared with pain, intense but mercifully brief, leaving him trembling. Whiskey Jack cursed Hood's breath as he struggled to calm his horse and looked around. He asked, what was that? Perrin thought he could not see as I saw. He has not the blood for that. Perrin said, Anamander Rake has arrived, sir. He descends among the Tistandi. He studied the chaos that had been the slumbering bridge burner's camp, then sighed. Well, it's a little early, but now's as good a time as any. He strode forward, raised his voice. Everyone up, break camp. Sergeant Ancy, rouse the cooks, will you? Ancy said, uh, aye, sir. What woke us? Perrin said, a gust of wind, Sergeant. Now get moving. Ancy said, aye, sir. Whiskey Jack said, Captain. Perrin turned to Whiskey Jack and said, sir. Whiskey Jack said, I believe you will find yourself busy for the next few bells. I return to Brood's tent. Would you like me to send Silver Fox to you for a final goodbye? Perrin hesitated, then shook his head and said, No, thank you, sir. He thought, Distance no longer presents a barrier to us. A private, personal link, too fraught to be unveiled to anyone. Her presence in my head is torture enough. Perrin said, Fare you well, Commander. Whiskey Jack studied him a moment longer, then nodded. He wheeled his horse around and nudged the gelding into a trot. That would be rough having a direct link from somebody into your head. Yeah. Especially with how he feels conflicted about that person right now. Yeah, that'd be awkward. (laughs) It would. And then uh, Rake just flying low over the camp like Tom Cruise buzzing the tower. Air Force One. Yeah, I mean. (laughs) Here comes Air Force One. What's he doing? I don't know. Maybe he's got to put on a show. I don't know if it's a show. I I don't think he's. uh, Everyone else just detected a win. So Rake knew that. But the thing is, it's just Perrin. mm -hmm. Perrin's awareness is different that's where the scene is that's why the scene is different it wouldn't have mattered anything to us if the wind had blown it woke everyone up it was blowing tents off of all their moorings man yeah it's like a hurricane wind well it was a little much i guess it's a little much maybe just wanted to just keep everyone it's just rake maybe just keep i don't know you got all the time in the world what do you do keep the folks on their toes i guess i don't know Nah, i don't pick that up from him i think he's too bored he may not not even be thinking that just may be what it is yeah he he may be so unaware of the mortals around him at some points not necessarily in a mean way just not aware of them oh you i forgot i'm sorry yeah (laughs) the tistandi are used to this yeah that makes sense all right we're gonna stop there this week and we will continue the chapter next week for standout moments the arrival of Krupp and the counselors from Daruzistan. Mm. Specifically, how Call reacted <laughs> to Krupp getting there before them and stealing the horses meant for the counselor's wagon. Absolutely priceless stuff. But I think with you in that scene, I, out of that scene, I just want to see that played out with the with the 
leg stepping out of the carriage slowly, <laughs> panning down slowly, panning up, 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 and it's like, and then it's revealed that it's corrupt. You're like, oh gosh, it's like Jar Jar Binks all of a sudden showing up. You know, you're like, you're you're, you're expecting something else, but no, it's Jar Jar. You're like, oh gosh, not yeah. this guy. I love like, the <laughs> foot is probing daintily. Yes. That just cracks me up. I know what me too. It's just absolutely amazing. Brood losing his patience with Crone and Krupp. Oh. I see a very disturbing pattern emerging here for Brood. <laughs> oh, this is just the intro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I did enjoy the little bit of levity that everyone else had laughing at Brood's reaction to them. That was good. Oh, yeah. Oh, really good. This really a very funny coverage tonight. Almost the whole thing was all lighthearted for the most part. Yeah. I enjoyed Krupp weaseling his way into the proceedings to bid on the contract on behalf of the Trigal Trade Guild and then running circles around everyone to the point that Silver Fox fell asleep and the Mibe had to leave the tent for a break. That is just absolutely masterful. And also, let's not forget the fact that while negotiating this contract on behalf of the Trigal Trade Commission, he is getting a big fat wad of money himself, I'm assuming, because he's just that good. What does he do with it? I don't know. Is he like the Tooth Fairy and Family Guy? He's got a pile of money. He just goes and lays on it occasionally just because that's what he wants. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I he steals know. all the food and everything from everybody. Yeah. I, I got no idea, man. He's all smoke and mirrors. Yeah. So I, I just don't know. We know he's more benevolent than he appears to be. He's probably, you know, he's probably funding orphanages. Yeah. You know, I was about to say the exact same thing. That's you know, probably, he's probably doing stuff like that. Something big time beneficial. Yeah. Kalam being identified as the assassin of shadow. That was pretty cool. Kind of surprised me. Yeah. That was really cool. I like that. Mm -hmm. Was there a reading that reading that happened at the beginning of dead house gates in that keep with that lady that was supposedly fake was that that might have been hinting at that stuff there that might be like a direct link in time you know what Cameron? you're probably right because that's probably happening at the exact same moment because obelisk came out in that reading as well if i remember correctly i think you're right so that's this is and this is where we really are going to start seeing the true linkages of like this is not going on one book after the other no this is going on simultaneously right <laughs> as dead house gates this yeah. isn't a sequel to dead house gates uh -huh. this is going on parallel and that's a kind of a wild and when you start looking at it like that it starts really freaking me out on how mr erickson has this laid out so beautifully it's mind-boggling dude this mind -boggling. It's, yeah it's a big world and stuff's going on there's stuff going on in other places that we haven't found out about yet this time yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's all new, dude. It's, it's, especially when we examine it, like we go through it, it brings stuff that even though I'm familiar with, it still brings a lot of stuff really deep to uh, really here to light in a different way. I like this so much. Right. I enjoyed parents handling of the return of broods table. Oh. That was so good. Oh, that is so brilliant, dude. So, f and it's, it actually, and I think it's those kind of things that are also like it or not, that's the kind of things that earns the respect of the bridge burners when they get out foxed mm. by, by someone that that's like that is their commander or their other directly was like, he's good. He's getting good. <laughs> yeah, he's getting good. That kind of, that was, yes. <laughs> but that's, but that's the only thing that they respect that they respond to. So it's, it's, it's brilliant. It's absolutely masterful. Yeah, because he wasn't an asshole about it. No. He played their game with them. Yes. And did it better. <laughs> and they knew it. Yes. And they knew it. And it's like, dad, gum it. Well done, soldier. Yeah. Well done. Now I want y'all to carry that back to Brood for us. He's like, yeah. <laughs> Finally, I enjoyed Perrin's ability to see the aura surrounding Rake as he flew over the camp. Yeah, that's really cool. Starting to see some... Uh, seeing what's going on with him have come to light and come to the forefront. It's really interesting. New abilities. He can see yes. things that nobody else can see. Yes. Do things that nobody else can do. <laughs> what's bad is when I hear part of that, part of me thinks, wait, are you talking about the six million dollar man or Neo? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm talking about the six demon bags. <laughs> <laughs> That always works so good for me. I love the six demon bag reference. <laughs> All right, Billy, great job tonight. Oh, great episode, bro. Great episode. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? I do. I just got to say this whole chapter coming, especially next week's, I think, I think we'll conclude next week. Don't you? 
I don't know. Uh, we'll see. We may not. Uh, probably, if we do, probably. Through the conclusion, however long this many parts this chapter is, this whole chapter with the table, pair and card, crone and Kruppa, the bridge burners getting out Fox, it's all sedagum funny. I fear for the heaviness that is coming. Because we Deadhouse Gate started with some good humor too, with uh, some of that stuff. Remember when that when we we're first introduced to Coltane? That that madman is the leader of the mm-hmm. you know, yeah. there's these it's like those are so funny, but they're not funny, but they are to us as the reader. But you're like, oh he's getting us in a good mood. Is he, is he going to kick our legs out from under us? You know, it's coming, mm. <laughs> you know, it's going to do it to us, but it's such a core chapter and it's such a core memory for me. And I just love this chapter dearly because it's like, it's the first time that all these people, these big players that we've met kind of are breaking bread together in a way. And I like that for some reason. I just really love that. Yeah. We'll see my heart. I don't know how much more it can take Billy. Yeah. And we're only, yeah, we're only three tenths of the, we're, we're starting three tenths of the way through. It's like, dude, there's a lot of heartbreak to come, bro. Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. All right. Thanks everybody. We'll see you next week. We'll see y'all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.